Ladies and gentlemen, the topic for the closing plenary session is Mankind to Moonkind, Humanity's Future in Space, which is a very interesting topic to attend. I would request everybody to kindly take their seats as soon as possible. Can we request someone to ring the bell, please? Ladies and gentlemen, once again requesting everybody to be seated. We are ready to go ahead with the closing plenary session. So ladies and gentlemen, we now go ahead with the proceedings of the closing plenary session, Mankind to Moonkind, Humanity's Future in Space. Ladies and gentlemen, this panel discussion Ladies and gentlemen, this panel discussion envisions a future where humans live and work beyond Earth, specifically on the Moon and beyond. This exciting prospect requires overcoming challenges such as creating sustainable habitats, ensuring life support systems and developing the necessary infrastructure for our aspirations to venture beyond our home planet and establish a thriving human presence in space. And may I invite our distinguished chair for this session, Sri Imtiaz Ali Khan, Director of Human Space Program, Directorate ISRO. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to welcome him. Also inviting our eminent speakers, Mr. Gurinder Chauhan, CEO and founder, QSTC. Once again, a warm welcome, sir. Inviting Mr. George Winman, Senior Director, Blue Origin. A very warm welcome, sir. And also inviting Mr. Pallava Bagla, science journalist. Very warm welcome. So ladies and gentlemen, once again, a very warm welcome to the closing plenary, Mankind to Moonkind, Humanity's Future in Space. And I hand over to our distinguished chair and moderator, Shri Imtiaz Ali Khan, Director of Human Space Program, Directorate, ISRO, to kindly take over the proceedings of the session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And let me welcome you to this uh, final plenary session. Uh, it's a very exciting topic uh, from mankind to moonkind, humanity's future in space. And I'm glad that we've got uh, three panelists from diverse background. We have uh, Mr. Pallav Bagla, who's a science journalist and who needs no introduction to this audience. And then we have Mr. George Weinman, who is from Blue Origin. So, you know, uh, Blue Origin is a company who already have their plans for uh, a space station and beyond. And then when we have Mr. Gurvinder Chauhan from QSTC. And they have, you know, very ambitious plans 
for resource exploration, for robotics and things like that. So I'm sure we'll have uh, a variety of uh, uh, thoughts, variety of opinions, and we'll get to hear more from them. But to start with, I thought uh, I was requested to give a brief introduction on Gaganyan as to what we are doing uh, at ISRO for this mission. So I'll just uh, you know, be very brief with my presentation. I don't want to take too much of your time because uh, we have distinguished speakers here. And I would also request them that perhaps they can also you know, have a brief talk to start with, maybe a, a small presentation if they have. And that can be limited to something like five to seven minutes each. And perhaps then we can have a question answer session and some, we could take some questions from the audience as well. So if this is uh, agreeable, I think we'll just proceed with the presentation. Okay, so uh, I'll just give a brief uh, perspective on Indian uh, human space program that is Gaganyan. Now, uh, as many of you may be aware, actually even before Gaganyan started, the pre-project activities for Gaganyan started way back in 2009. And this was after uh, we accomplished the space capsule recovery experiment in 2007. And various technologies, including the launch vehicle, the crew escape system, those were being developed at uh, various ISRO centers. And we had two major missions. One was in 2014, which was the crew module atmospheric recovery experiment. And then we, in 2014, and then we had the pad abort test in 2018, which gave us the sort of required uh, confidence to you know, go back uh, to the government and seek necessary approvals. And uh, at, at the same time, the, in terms of launch vehicles, we had graduated from PSLV to GSLV and then to Mark III, which had the requisite capability of carrying 10 tons payload to low Earth orbit. So this is when you know, we followed the government process and we had the approval uh, in late 2018 and the project was formed in 2019 and we had this ambitious mission for carrying two to three astronauts to a low Earth orbit uh, of 400 kilometers and uh, ensure that they are, uh, they are safely in orbit for up to three days and then bring them back safely. If you see the crew module, that is the inner section of the crew module and you can see the astronaut lying in reclining position inside the crew module. Now, uh, in terms of the execution strategy for any uh, human space program, you need to have lots of testing. So this is how uh, it's a different ball game compared to the other missions of ISRO. So the human rating, the qualification, the detailed uh, testing that is required, uh, that takes its own time. But we're glad that we are there uh, in terms of the launch vehicle, we are ready, the human rating has been completed. The crew escape system, solid motors are ready. The crew module propulsion system and the service module propulsion system, the modules are ready. And we, I also met some of the people who are actually involved in this task uh, from the respective centers. So Mr. Baiju is there so in, from the uh, you know, crew module propulsion system side. I also saw the test vehicle project director was there. So we have uh, you know, a large team that is involved in uh, various parts of this activity. And what we intend to do is, even before going to the flight, we want to have sort of pre-flight testing, you know, especially for the crew escape system and the parachute-based deceleration system. So we want to carry the crew module at different altitudes. Good evening, sir. So, uh, so that is how we expect to graduate to the unmanned mission. So we will have at least two unmanned missions uh, in identical configuration before going to the manned mission. This is something new that we are doing for the mission. This is the environment control and life support system. And you know, uh, as long as human being is not there, you're not uh, worried about this. But here you need to create a shirt sleeve environment in space for the astronaut. So everything is budgeted. Everything needs to be controlled. You need to have temperature, humidity, cabin pressure, partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and you know, the, the quantum of water that he's going to take on board, the oxygen that he's going to uh, consume, the carbon dioxide that he's going to release, all that has to be budgeted for and provided for. So this is a challenging activity, and uh, we are taking this uh, development indigenously. Then in terms of impact on human body, I think every part of human body gets impacted by space flight. Uh, even for a short duration mission, you of course have nausea, you have problems due to isolation and confinement, but then 
In the recent missions for long duration missions, it has been noticed that astronauts traveling back from space station after a long duration flight, they have seen differences in being able to read the panels. So there's something called a SANS, the neuroocular syndrome. So uh, there is sort of vision loss. Uh, you have fluid shift, fluid moves to the upper part of the body due to lack of gravity. Muscles aren't needed, so muscles get weaker. Their bones get weaker. You also have you know, the spinal cord getting extended slightly. And thanks to efforts by various advanced space-faring nations, and particularly the International Space Station, I think many of these things are uh, well understood today. Today, we are not, uh, not in a stage where you have basic questions like how you will be eating food, how the basic metabolic system will perform in space. But you have those answers ready, so you can start from uh, where we are globally today. So that is one advantage that we have, and uh, thankfully all the spacefaring nations, they openly sort of uh, cooperate on these issues, and we have very good international collaboration with the uh, US, with Russian Federation, with France, with European Space Agency, with all the advanced spacefaring nations. But today, where we are standing, and I leave this with this slide, I think we need to look further. Uh, uh, we, we are aware that these are dreams, these are far-fetched things, but we need to look at future space habitats because the human civilization needs to have a backup, needs to have another uh, sort of Q2 or Plan B or Plan C. And they need to also have returns, like it's not just enough to spend money and go somewhere, but it will not be sustainable if you do not have returns. So people have to work towards human resources exploration, and towards this, space stations are a first step. Uh, already we have the International Space Station. I'm glad that today private industries are taking up research for space stations. In terms of life support systems, we will need to, the life support system, what we are thinking about today for Gaganyan is a short duration mission, are like one-time things, expendable ones. But you need to look at regenerative life support systems and environment monitoring systems. For radiation, for space debris, there have to be protection things. You need to carry out extravehicular activities and a range of human-centric products. So I leave it here. I think this is just to initiate into the subject. And now I would like to welcome Mr. George Wine for his presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's exciting to be back here in New Delhi for the Indian Space Congress. I had the pleasure of being here last year at the inaugural event, and it's a pleasure to be back again. Um, the Indian Space Congress obviously doing a great job of bringing the community together, and that's really what space flight, particularly human space flight, is all about. Um, this is not an endeavor that we do lightly or on our own. Uh, coming together to operate in a, a human, uh, I'll call it diaspora of all of us on Earth, taking our first steps away from our first spacecraft, which is our Earth itself, into the cosmos is something that is really important for us to do as a, as a global community. Um, humankind going into space, and, and I'd like to emphasize humankind as opposed to mankind, um, is an exciting and enabling future. The technologies that have come from spaceflight development have direct applications to almost everything we do here on Earth. Um, as many of my colleagues in the venture capital industry now say, every company is a space company, whether you know it or not. Um, the enabling future, of course, also comes from the fact that our perspective changes as we travel away from our little blue marble of Earth. Uh, travelers to uh, space on our new Shepard rocket come back changed. Uh, we've had the pleasure of flying um, 31 people into uh, above the Kármán line on our new Shepard suborbital rocket. Um, 5% of the entire uh, population of astronauts that are women have flown on New Shepard, so we're excited about that. It's a much more even ratio on those flights. Uh, we've also flown the youngest person to space, 18 years old, and the oldest person to space at 90 years old uh, on our New Shepard flight. Um, and those first steps, when they go up and they see the shiny blue marble from space, because you are really up there, you are, you are seeing the blackness of space, as William Shatner, Captain Kirk, who said when he flew on New Shepard, the blackness of space, it's like death. And here you are, this precious blue marble of Earth, and how precious and wonderful it is for us. So spaceflight is really an enabling, but also exciting future for humanity. I, I think it's more than just a plan B. It's also a plan A to continue to help 
humanity's future development and for us to see us for who we are, all one creature operating on this earth. As you all know, India has become part of the Artemis program, and we're all in the United States, we're very excited to see that announcement. No, no presentation. This is, uh, I'll show a video in a moment. Um, uh, so we're very excited to see India be part of the Artemis program and to help be part of setting the rules and standards and norms of humanity's travel into space. This is something we do together, and we're excited to see India being part of that discussion. The next flight to the moon will be not just the next man to the moon, but also the next woman to the moon. Um, and we're going to the moon to stay. Blue Origin has the privilege and honor of being part of um, the Artemis program. We have been selected to build the next human lander to land on the moon. So we'll be the crewed lander for Artemis V. And this set of landers that we're developing is really quite exciting. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about it. Um, I'm going to, if I can put up one slide here. Let's all let him. Just, can, it, can this be checked or no? Okay. So, this is a picture of what the Blue Moon Lander looks like. Um, it is uh, a, a big program for NASA. Um, it is a reusable lander. So it will fly to the moon and then land on the moon and then take off from the moon and remain in lunar orbit to be used again at least once a year for the next decade or so. Uh, we're building two versions of this lander. One is a cargo lander. The other one's a crewed lander. Crewed lander takes about four people. And interestingly enough, you may see the odd shape here. The crew are on the bottom. Unlike the, in the Apollo landers where the crew capsule sat on top, in this case, the crew module is down on the bottom. And the reason is, is that when you get to the moon, you want to be able to open that door and get out, unload your cargo, and do it at a safe distance from the, from the soil. Uh, so we put actually the fuel pods up on top, and the car crew lander is actually on the bottom. This enables you to be able to connect this to a future moon base relatively easily, because you're right down at the surface. Um, and the lander itself, as I said, is reusable. To make that lander reusable, we have to bring fuel from Earth to the moon to refuel it in lunar orbit. And so we've, we are working with a number of partners to develop a whole system of in-flight refueling capability where we launch fuel from the Earth into Earth orbit and then put it onto a transporter that will go to the moon and refuel the lander uh, in lunar orbit. We've made this more difficult for us, but more exciting for us by choosing hydrogen and oxygen as our fuel and oxidizer. And as most of you probably know, those are uh, cryogenic fuels. Cryogenic fuels uh, need to stay very, very cold. So to do that, we're inventing a cryo cooler that will allow us to maintain those cryogenic fuels at cryogenic temperatures throughout the entire spaceflight activity. Why go to all of this trouble? Well, we all hope there's water on the moon. And if there is, in fact, water on the moon, then we'll be able to eventually refuel those landers on the moon itself. And to do that, we have to be able to switch slides. That's the first thing we have to be able to do. We have to be able to mine resources on the moon. And if we can mine those resources on the moon, we can um, put them through reactors and separate their components. And eventually, we'll be able to make solar cells. So Blue Origin has put together a capability we call Blue Alchemist. It's kind of a fun name where we're able to take lunar regolith and have prototyped demonstrated that we can take the simulated lunar regolith, separate it into its res respective components, and literally out the back end of the machine comes solar panels. So we'll be able to create power systems and mine oxygen, uh, iron, aluminum, and silicon uh, out of the lunar soil, which will enable a future of humanity's uh, step steps onto the moon. Before we get to the moon, though, uh, we need to continue to enhance our ability to operate in space. And so, to that end, we are also very excited about our future space station, Orbital Reef. So I'm going to show a brief video to introduce Orbital Reef, which hopefully will play nicely here. We have played it a minute ago, we'll see if it plays again. Sorry, not, not this one, this one. 
Incidentally. Yes. So Orbital Reef is our commercial space station designed in collaboration with several partners. Um, it's designed to replace the International Space Station when the International Space Station retires at the end of this decade or early in the next decade. Uh, the ISS has been a fantastic science vessel for humanity. It is uh, also getting old, and we believe that the next generation of space station should be expandable and accessible to everyone, both civil users so space agencies, as well as commercial users and consumers who have interest in traveling to space for a variety of personal reasons, whether they be noble causes or just for the fun of it because they want to be a tourist. Um, Orbital Reef is also designed to be accessible and open to a variety of nations to participate. And so to that end, we're very excited to be in discussions here with India on how it can participate in Orbital Reef, as well as many other nations around the world. The other exciting thing about Orbital Reef is it is expandable um, and has room to grow as we move from a society able to afford this on a national basis with civil space agencies to a society that can also engage on a commercial basis. And it's important that we separate these different functions out so that we aren't mixing tourists and scientists and researchers and operators all in the same place. They each need to have their own place. And so that's a uh, part of what we envision for the future. So with that, I, I'll, I'll wrap up here in just a moment. Um, what I'd finally like to say is that this is our generation's task. This, for many of us, is our version of the Notre Dame or the Taj Mahal or the Great Pyramids. This is what the legacy that we are building to show our future, the people who will come in generations after us, what we can do today to advance humanity and our place in the world. But it's not just about us. It's also about bringing that future um, to, to, to exist, and to that end, we have to inspire the next generation. And so Blue Origin has a program called Club for the Future, where we are investing significantly in the next generation of uh, people who will take us to the stars. Uh, and one of our exciting programs is called Postcards to Space, where anybody who goes to our website, or we're hoping to engage with several uh, groups here in India in the future, you can send a postcard to space with Blue Origin. Uh, you draw your picture, say what space means to you, and get it to us, and we will fly it into space and mail it back to you. And so we're hoping that this can be a way to inspire a whole new generation uh, of STEM and STEAM uh, leaders. The A is also very important. As we go into space, we're not just going for research or for science, we're also going to be all of humanity and all the great things that make us human. So with that, I'll pass the comment on the floor back to our STEAM chairman. Thank you, Mr. Weinman. Um, Orbital Reef is, of course, a very exciting prospect, and we are all eagerly looking forward to it. Let me now invite Mr. Gurvinder Chauhan for his uh, presentation. Very good afternoon, and uh, 
first of all, I would like to thank you and gratitude to the organizer for organizing such a good event, an excellent event actually. And at the same time, thank you all the audience because for their patience and uh, their consistent approach and attendance of all these sessions, it won't be such a success. And this event has been very, very eye-opener for many of us. And as we learned a lot of new things about India and what's going on in India, as well as on the global prospects, what's happening. And since this is the last session, and uh, I hope, and this is a good session actually, you kept at the last, uh, best for the last. And here we're going to discuss something about future. What is holding a future for mankind? And as we know, like as I grew up in the back old, we used to watch, uh, uh, I don't know if anybody knows, uh, uh, Galactic Star 2000. It's a very old 1980s, uh, I'm too old to say, but we used to watch that. That's the first exposure to the space, like the space exploration. Then we had these, all the star movies and uh, enterprise, which gives a glimpse of human. That's at the knowledge or set a base for us to understand. How does we understand the space? Where do we go from there? That gives a lot of ideas to all the scientists. And if you look at today, whatever everybody claims to say, most of the ideas are coming from those shows which were done in the 1980s. Well, we can claim, but honest, honesty is honesty. We have to get the ideas from there and we are getting. With that prospect, I put some slides together and there are some slides which we are working on and some are slides which are our partners and uh, some one slide is particularly for uh, our pride, Canadian Arm, which we are part of uh, Lunar Gateway. And so I'm going to give you a glimpse what we are doing right now. So the first part is, uh, which is most key important of us is the lunar mining, which we are looking into or mining colony. Uh, there is the LSIC, Lunar Surface Innovation Committee. And as I had invited yesterday to a lot of audience that please go to this site, LSIC, and become a member. It's all free. And this is the best resource for technical information you can get on lunar mining, what's happening, what technologies is being developed, and who is doing what. And uh, this is a glimpse what we are targeting. We are part of the, this committee. And this is a sort of roadmap. By 2035, we would like to have a first uh, mining mission with the concept of being this type of uh, set up a human habitat on the, on, on the moon. So this habitat will have everything, life sport, water, the power generation, and as well as full ecosystem. So this is the full ecosystem, what is being planned right now on the, on the moon, lunar surface. And if you look at the source characterization, the extraction, processing, resource planning, in situ tra preparation, transportation, and bringing back to the earth. So the whole concept of mining is being duplicated over there. So right now, uh, there is a perfect two examples which I would like to give you. There are two things which are being developed. One we call is the drilling. You know, for any mining you use a drill. And most of the time, for the drills you need water to, uh, to cool it. Because otherwise it overheat drills, bits, and then they can break. So right now, the scientists are developing a technology to where we don't need to any water to cool it down. That's the one thing. And that will be flowed down to the mining industry on Earth. So that's why when uh, Sir said that everything what we use on Earth is coming from space. So every Earth company is a space company. So that's what it is, comes out to that. The second is the power generation. Right now, there is a non-radiative uh, power generation being developed. We are talking about 50 to 100 megawatt of power generation and no radiative uh, nuclear power plants. That means there's no radiation, no earth, uranium or any type of uh, material we are using. And third is that south side of the moon being a very resourceful, we are trying to get some elements, helium for example, bring it back, process it and use it to power generation. And no wonder everybody is running towards the south side of the moon because that's where the bombardment of uh, solar cell is and you're getting more helium to bring me back. And they, you will be surprised to know the very first paper was written by IIT, professor from IIT in Chennai on helium. And taken that uh, article, the German and the one Russian company, they start the processing plants. They did a first prototype processing plant to process the helium to use it for the energy, produce production of energy. Right now, the estimate is about 100 gram of helium you can produce power 
to use to provide the power to do entire state of New York for about 10 years. So just imagine, just a hundred gram of helium powering your entire state of New York for 10 years. And today's cost is about 2.6 billion dollars. So that is the real attraction. Everybody is running towards south side of the city of the moon. And in four or five weeks ago, there was an article from a Chinese, I don't know if you have read it or no. Actually, they publicly announced it, that this is the first ever extraction done from the moon, and this is the element we found, and this is the processing done. So anybody can Google it, it's available in public domain info. So this is what we are planning to do. This is our lender, our own lender we have developed. This is our own design, uh, no, lender design you can see. I'll go here. So on the top, on the top you can see that we have a micro rover. And uh, this is lander. And there's the micro rovers that you can go all over the moon, do all the analysis you do. This is one of the min, uh, lightest micro rover which we have developed. And on the right side, you can see there is a small uh, mini rover and that is we developed for Canadian Space Agency with the robotics arm, which does a lot of uh, in, in situ exploration and everything. And the far side, ExoMars 2028-26 qualified, that's our base for rover. So these same vehicle uh, wheels are used right now for lunar train vehicle for NASA, because uh, these are the one of the first of its kind uh, wheels, where, which are based on caterpillar principle. That means it can climb up to 45 degree inclination camp, uh, and as well as it has the flexibility. No, it's too late. Thank you. So that that's already qualified 2026. So we are hoping that we will be the final to fly to moon uh, to Mars actually. And on the bottom, you see some of the other example uh, rovers we have designed and developed. So this is a gateway which we everybody knows it that we, it's been already planned and uh, work has already been started. Most of the modules are being developed by different, different agencies and a different type of, uh, here is a complete. And this is the perfect example of collaboration. International collaboration, different agencies, how many people, how many agencies and how many private industries are part of this gateway. So this illustrates that we all can work together. And this will be a, a perfect example of a humankind and setting an example for our, uh, our future generation. And this will be hosting about uh, 24 days per year, uh, some astronauts, and the rest of the time is going to be used for experiments and everything. So those 24 days will be used by the astronauts to go to the moon. There will be uh, there is a module which will go to the moon and bring back to the gateway. It will be like a resting place for the astronauts. Rather than going direct to the moon, they will be stopping at the gateway, spending a few days, and then going to the moon, and then coming back. So this illustrates. So we are proud that from Canada, we are going to be participating in providing the Canada gateway and uh, the power modules. So these are the two big contribution from, from Canada. So this, we are part of this uh, recently for a, what we call Lunar Net program. And this is right now being developed by Nokia and uh, Vodafone and Ericsson as well. So they are trying to have a 5G network on the, on the surface of the moon. So this will be both RF and optical communication between, uh, in between Earth, uh, between Earth, moon or via relay. So there are different type of uh, architect being uh, explored. So we are doing a similar sort of concept with the uh, uh, lunar constellation that will be providing data services. Like for example, a lot of people are going, a lot of uh, space agencies, private parties and everybody is going to the moon and eventually they need have a communication system from moon to earth. So we are working on developing some constellation where we can transfer the data from moon to earth via relay or direct. So this is again a concept how, how we have visualized it, how is going to work it out and it does full global coverage, any type and different type of bands, K, X and S bands, so you can use different, different bands. Uh, now again, switching gear, this is the rover, and this is the wheels we are using and providing for our current vehicle. And it has an inbuilt thermal control systems uh, on, on the wheels, this is one of its kind. 
and this will be the navigation system and various instruments which we are developing for this and there are four or five type of instruments on board like spectrum analysis, uh, geothermal analysis, 3D camera, LIDAR, LIDARs and uh, this is one of the uh, geology instrument camera what we are that is the onboard camera which does analysis, takes the picture and then there is the automatic uh, onboard processing capabilities that will tell you what type of uh, soil constituents are. So this is the illustration of our robotic system which we have done for the rover where you can see on the top that can move left, right, wherever you want. There's other examples. Uh, that's the full architect of our rovers. Uh, that's a big arm, which, uh, which will be the full robotics arm. This will be used for, uh, for our next project. And as uh, you can see that there will be cargo deck and then we have a robotics arm on the side. And uh, this is being we are providing in this part of the, this project, we are providing the robotics arm, communication system, and as well uh, wheels for the locomotive. And finally, then we have a Google map, what we call a moon Google map. So we have a full compilation of all the Google uh, map for, uh, for moon, where we can do full navigation programming where you want to go. You can pre-program like it's similar, exactly like a Google map, you can use it. And uh, then there's the onboard processing and onboard built-in navigation system, which does control. Since these vehicles are autonomous, that means you don't need to be there you can control and drive it from that. So that means these will be used by the universities, research, research institutes and various organizations across the year whenever they want. They can lease it, rent it and they can use for their experiment purposes. And that's it. Thank you very much and happy to answer any question if you have. Thank you, Mr. Chauhan. So, you have your hands full for the coming years from in-situ resource utilization to autonomous rovers to optical communication. I think we'll have the questions later. Uh, let us have the views of Mr. Pallav Bagla and then maybe we can go over to the discussion part. Uh, namaskar and welcome. Uh, I am neither a space technologist, nor an astronaut, nor a space specialist. I am a journalist who reports space very closely, and I have done that for the last uh, 25 or 30 years, uh, having looked at many space programs but deeply reporting the Indian Space Research Organization, uh, which I have been visiting for a very long time and following it very closely. Uh, let me start off by saying these are very, very exciting times, uh, both for India and for the world. And since my own uh, strength lies more with India, let me start off by saying that We have an exciting Gaganyan program coming up and Imtiaz is here leading the charge from the front and we hope we will be able to send an Indian astronaut from Indian soil on an Indian rocket hopefully soon, maybe 2024 end or maybe very soon after that, uh, provided all the tests go through. I've had great opportunity to interact with uh, many astronauts and I've learned from them many things about space reporting and people in India love not just space but the Indian Space Research Organization. It is a jewel in the crown, absolutely no doubt about that. And People are anxiously now waiting for Friday, 2.35 p.m., when India goes back towards the moon with Chandrayaan-3. Uh, as a country, I must say, folks, don't be sad or sullen if others are sending astronauts, if others are sending, have an international space station up and running for a long time. 
we've seen this. India may join later, but sometimes leapfrog and give stuff which has been missed out by many, many countries. Uh, let me take the example of Chandrayaan-1. Uh, our friend from Blue Origin spoke about water. His nation went to the moon in 1969. Neil Armstrong tramped all over the place. Twelve of them walked on the moon. I'm told one of them even peed on the moon. But God forbid, did they find water on the moon? No. It was left for Imtiaz's organization in 2008 and then to find presence of water molecules on the moon. It changed the lunar history. It changed the geology of the moon once and for all. It was a sub-100 million dollar mission. I don't know how many billions of dollars were spent by the Apollo program and now the twin sister of Apollo, Artemis, is getting along. We will see maybe a trillion dollars being spent. But India with its Gaganyan program with 10,000 crores, trust me, we can do better. If what NASA can do, we can do with 10 times less cost. Which is why I say we saw during the Prime Minister Narendra Modi visit and President Joe Biden summit, the signing of the Artemis Accords. The US and the others need India on board. There are four space-sparing independent nations, only four, Russia, US, China, and India. Russia and China have formed their own alliance, so India was desperately needed by the US. So let's be clear. On Artemis, it is India joining with an equal partnership. So don't be mistaken. Whenever you go in, don't get taken in by what my friend from Blue Origin said. We will be equal partners and get there with less money, frugal technology, and be up there as totally equal partners. The Indian industry can do things a lot cheaper. I shouldn't say quality-wise equivalent, but the costs are much lower. We had our first astronaut going to space in 1984 with Rakesh Sharma, and he became the first uh, Antriksh Yogi. Yoga is much in vogue. And he was the first person to perform yoga in space, so I call him the Antriksh Yogi. We've had others from Indian origin up in space, uh, Kalpana Chawla, Sunita Williams, uh, Gentleman Chari. So we, we, but we have four of our own astronauts who are being trained. The Gaganyan program has selected four of them. If they go back Gaganyan, fine, but before that we have the opportunity to go by to the International Space Station on a joint mission with NASA. Very exciting possibilities. I'm very clear in my mind that sooner than later, Indians will set up a habitation outside the Earth and outside the International Space Station. Uh, moon, nearest neighbor, then Mars, we definitely will have habitation on the moon. And we should remember, where is the water on the moon right now? It's on the south, south pole of the moon. And where did India plant its flag on the moon? 2008, we put our flag down at the south pole of the moon. There are two countries which are permitting private ownership on moon. US and the Indian space policy also permits that. So you will soon see if rights have to be shared, somebody has to draw that water to make energy. Lo and behold, we have our flag and we have some rights there. You may, you may, need, you may need to go through 
our territory, a safety zone which Imtiaz's team has created long ago. Uh, I call that safety zone, uh, which is where we put in our moon impact probe in 2008, the southernmost point on the moon which anybody has ever gone. The Vikram lander crashed in the same area, again carried India's flag. The Vikram lander in Chandrayaan-3, if all goes well, on August 23rd, will put India's flag exactly in the same location. I have given that area a name. I call that the Kalam Vihar. It's a 10 square kilometer area in the southern pole region. And I, why do I call it Kalam Vihar? I call it Kalam Vihar for the specific reason, because it was our former president, APJ Abdul Kalam, who made sure that we had a flag on the moon. So I am very excited about that. Now let me put in a small bit of a reality check. Nothing can happen without reality checks. Lot is being spoken about helium-3. I haven't seen a viable plan of utilizing helium-3. The International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor ITER at Kadarsh, because it has to be used in a fusion reactor, is always 20 years late. So if it's now, it's going to come up in 2043. So how do you use util helium-3? I have no idea. That's a pipe dream being sold by many of our private space companies in uh, Western countries. The uh, same way with water, make fuel out of water, lovely. Do it on the moon, even better. God forbid, give me, give me that on Earth. We would solve all our climate change problems if you were to give me hydrogen and oxygen from splitting water on Earth. We are suffering from climate change. If we can find that solution on Earth, let's do it here. Yeah. Why wait to go to the moon and set up a base and do all that uh, technology stuff there? Let's do it right here. End of the day, humans are social animals. So if we go to the moon, where do we get social uptake and keep? And there's one question I asked uh, a veteran uh, astronaut for NASA, who was then an administrator to uh, uh, NASA, uh, General Charlie Bolden. I said, all's well. Humans are social. You want to go for long-term habitation? How do you do procreation? How do you have sex in the space? Very basic requirements. I have no answers for some of those things. Exciting times, but we need lots of answers. Uh, sooner than later, we will definitely have habitation on the moon, and definitely India will be part of any international uh, lunar space station which ever comes up, not just for necessity, but also by way of right. Southern Pole, we have our flag up there, and we will have exciting times coming with Chandrayaan-3, so let's bless ISRO for giving us more beautiful missions and Gaganyan it promises to be a very exciting mission. And Imtiaz is a very capable leader there. Uh, with this, I come to the end of whatever little I had to say. Uh, but Artemis, India, future of space, exciting. But keep a reality check in mind. A lot of dreams are being sold those dreams also have to come into reality. And Mr. Subbarao can give us a lot of the technology at 10 or 20 times cheaper than whatever is being made in the US. He has a grand facility in Bangalore, Hyderabad, and Trivandrum to make satellites. I'm sure sooner than later, NASA and others will use that. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Pallav Bagla, for that very open, very frank, and very candid comments. I think uh, you don't get this opportunity to ask questions to a journalist, so let me start with him first. So. <laughs> that is true. He doesn't get that.
<laughs> so I, else can also ask. Yeah. I think his uh, talk itself had a lot of questions. So I think it is by nature. So, he, so <laughs> this is the first time I get an opportunity. So let me ask you, sir, first. Why do you think uh, of all the places we want to go back to Moon? After so many years, you know, uh, there is interest back in Moon. Everybody is talking about Moon. What is your take on that? Maybe we'll have other opinions also, but we'll start with you first. Oh, very straightforward in my opinion because you're, that's moon is your closest neighbor. भाई हमारा चंदा मामा है वो मामा जी के पास नहीं जाएंगे तो कहाँ जाएंगे मामा जी के घर तो जाना जरूरी है मैंने people who don't understand Hindi uh, the moon is called Chanda Mama which is a maternal uncle and where else do you go you have to go to your maternal uncle's home so moon is the closest neighbor we go there and uh, beyond that we look at other opportunities we should not stop at just the moon. Uh, but be realistic about it, but also be sure that India will be a partner whenever Moon has to be revisited in the different capacities. Uh, be it, uh, India is already part of the Artemis uh, Cords. Uh, next step would be if there is an Artemis program association. I am sure that is why NASA insisted on India signing the Artemis Accords. So next step would be joining with the program. Then we join with strength. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your views on this? Why moon? I think from my perspective, it's uh, two ways. One is commercial. It's a pure commercial. Second is exploration. Like everybody's trying to set up a base on the moon, looking forward, go to Mars and further beyond down. These are the two aspects which I'm looking for. Okay. So I'm yeah, I think, you know, Blue Origin always has the view that we're going into space for the benefit of Earth, right? We're going to go into space, we're going to learn how to use the microgravity environment, we're going to learn how to use the resources in space. Why? Because we want to make Earth a very attractive place for humanity's home to always remain. And to that end, the moon is the closest place with significant natural resources which will enable humanity's expansion. Um, if we want to have millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth, which is, that's Blue Origin's vision, and I think many vision of all of us here in the room, then we need to be able to get to thousands of people living and working in space. And to get to thousands of people, you need to get to hundreds of people first. And to get to hundreds of people, you need to get to, to dozens. And we're cutting close to being able to do that. And so the whole vision is between orbital reef and the lunar landers and eventually a lunar base, is we're building the capacity and accessing the resources at the moon that will allow us to continue to build out the infrastructure that will eventually let us to have millions of people in space. Uh, just a, you know, a related question. I think Mr. Palabagla also spoke about that. How does the economics work out? Like when we talk about sustainable presence, when we talk about returns, have, uh, uh, in terms of space station, of course, it's the countries that are funding it. You know, largely the funds come from the countries. But when you talk about a space station by Blue Origin, uh, Orbital Reef, how does the economics of Orbital Reef work out? Sure. So, I think, let me start with the macro. Um, there are more nations on Earth now that can afford human spaceflight or spaceflight program in general than ever before. Uh, 20 years ago, there were, uh, I forget exactly how many, but uh, four, 30 some odd nations or something that, that had space programs. And, and now there's 77 and counting. More and more are growing. And we actually did a little kind of interesting little graph where we looked at GDP or GDP per capita. Um, and then we looked at uh, space programs. And interestingly enough, once you got past a certain level of GDP, absolute GDP in any given country or a group of countries together, they all had space programs. And so it seems that uh, as the world gets wealthier, that we're getting to an entry point where an incremental additional addition of GDP makes a whole lot more capacity to access space. So it's, it's starting with macroeconomics. Basically, we can afford it. Um, the second is uh, low Earth orbit is a whole lot closer and a lot cheaper to get to than the moon. Um, I don't remember what the exact gearing ratio is, but it's, it's a very large number. Going to the moon is extremely expensive, which is why the moon is attractive for its natural resources. If we can mine the moon, even very simple amounts of mining where we don't have to have big factories or dozens of people, but simple machines that can convert lunar regolith into 
um, structures that can protect us from, from radiation or convert it into oxygen or, or fuel, uh, that changes the whole game because now we don't have to send as much from Earth. Or if we do send things from Earth, we're sending only the most important things. Um, for Orbital Reef itself, uh, the accessibility to low Earth orbit now, whether it's for uh, individuals who are traveling for personal reasons, noble causes, or because they want to see the view, uh, but for also for the many, many more nations who can afford to fly to space, um, we're seeing economies of scale. And so that structure in orbit isn't just a place for an individual nation to do research. It's a place to interact, to in fact, do commerce amongst nations in space. Uh, my colleague here, uh, Mr. Uh, Pallava, you made the comment that India brings a lot to the global space program, and that's true. India has a lot to contribute, and will have a lot to contribute in the years ahead. France, the United States, Japan, Canada, all the different countries around the world have different things to contribute. If we all contribute our strengths and combine those, we are all getting a much bigger pie. And that's what shapes the economy. So global trade on Earth can also be global trade in space. And when we do that, the economies of scale get even better and better. And so that's how a space station uh, becomes essentially profitable, is because we trade. We exchange goods and services in space amongst civil space agencies, but also amongst um, commercial entities as well. Thank you. So uh, can we have some questions from the audience? Please. And you can tell to whom it is addressed. It is more of a comment than a question because uh, 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 Pallav Bagla spoke very well, Chanda Mama Pe Jana. We have been looking at the moon since our childhood days and all that. I remember Isaac Asimov and Isaac Asimov said that earth is a cradle and mankind has to leave it later or sooner. And I think that's coming as a reality. So Pallav spoke very well. He challenged everybody else who has been developing technology. <clears throat> but I would like to add something to that, to thank US, NASA and Russian space program who were the pioneers. They created that technology, they created that challenge and everybody is following it up. India is also doing a great job and everybody is doing a great job. But the pioneers should be acknowledged. One whom I would like to acknowledge very specifically is Werner von Braun, who the American picked up from Germany and he did basic rockets in, um, in US, NASA and also a part of it was taken by Russia. You know, one thing is that we, it is a collective enterprise now, the way the world is facing the problem. And uh, perhaps uh, I would like to ask George, uh, what kind of collaborations one can think of in which technologies can be freely shared and, and developed so that the earth can find a solution to the problem which we are facing. Thank you. Sure. Well, I'd like to thank you for your, your kind comments. And I think uh, while the United States has done a lot in space, if you've, not, if you've noticed over the past several decades, we've done a lot with a lot of other countries too. Uh, this has been a collaborative effort for quite a long time. And I think it's uh, the fact that the United States has always taken the attitude that uh, humanity's outreach into space should be peaceful and we should go as a community of nations is, is always a very important foundation for what we do. I'd also like to just briefly mention a little bit about Blue Origin and in respect to um, your comment on, on international relations and respecting our, our the people who came before us. Um, at Blue Origin we have these things called business resource groups, so groups of employees who have a common sort of aspect or something that they share in common. And it's one of the reasons why we named our first rocket New Shepard, to recognize Alan Shepard, who was the first suborbital astronaut from the United States, and New Glenn, which was our first uh, uh, orbital uh, astronaut from the United States. So we're naming our rockets after some of our forefathers. But then we also have a business resource group called um, New Chala, named after, of course, the Indian astronaut who uh, came to the United States, was an immigrant to the United States, and uh, one of the early female astronauts. Um, and we continue to honor her memory and legacy as part of uh, Blue Origin as well, even though she was never a member of Blue Origin. So to answer your question, um, I think there are lots of different ways to collaborate. One of the things I, I noticed that the space industry now is it's not just for space people. So India has an extremely large and fast-growing pharmaceutical and biotechnology sector. 
Uh, it also is beginning to do more in material science. And in microgravity research, well, on Earth, we have a gravity problem. And in space, that with the absence of gravity, we can do all sorts of new things in biology, and with pharmaceuticals, and also with um, material science. And so I think it's interesting that if countries can use their natural strengths, not just in the space program, but also in other areas, and to, I'll extend that to culture and arts as well, that we need to bring all of our talents and strengths into the space program, or into, I'll say, space commerce, uh, not just the things that the engineers who grew up on science fiction uh, particularly enjoy. Uh, it's, it's really a, a whole of nation effort and the benefits will benefit everybody. Thank you. So uh, since you said about biotechnology, I was reminded that now people are discussing about biomanufacturing. So you can use microorganisms to convert chemicals into useful materials. And that is where my next question is, uh, perhaps it's open, I think you may like to answer it. So in terms of evolution, even on Earth, the sequence of evolution as we understand today is like, it's the microorganisms that preceded and then multicellular organisms and then we went into reptiles and things like that. So instead of uh, sending human beings to moon straight away, why don't we think about uh, a sequence wherein you could also uh, do some, you know, initially start with microorganisms on moon and then do some of these biomanufacturing activities and then go on to human beings. Thoughts? So, I, it's very interesting because uh, last year in IAC in Paris, I had a honor to interact with some of the companies in France and in fact they invited us to their bio lab. And what they are doing, they are developing a, a sort of a incubators, a CubeSat incubators. And those CubeSat incubators are modular. That means they send one module and then they keep on attaching the different modules. And inside those, there are seeds, germination seeds. And they are trying to grow in space. So the concept is, like for future generations and everything, they are going to set up the base or life support system where you can have a food grown on in space, which can be used in, let's say, a lunar colony or Mars in the future. So it's already in work. And I was surprised to see that they had a hall much bigger than this, and they showed us the full concept, like all the modules and how the habitat will be living, like starting from the microorganisms and germination seed, and then seed germination plants, and then getting the crop, and then how it will be consumed and then again recycling the whole ecosystem. It's very fantastic. If somebody wants to know, I can dig up some info about that company. It's already a work in process. Your views? I have no views. Okay. Whosoever you said is fine by me. <laughs> I will report it. I, I think MTS wants to get uh, enough bioorganisms on the moon before the humans get there so that they'll evolve and then we can discover aliens on the moon. <laughs> Okay, any other questions from the audience? Yeah, please. Uh, I wanted to know, so Mr. George clearly mentioned that, sorry. Um, hi. So, Mr. George clearly mentioned that the motto for Blue Origin is using exploration on the moon for the benefit of Earth. And um, I realize that when we go to the moon, we have to slowly start uh, depending less on the resources on Earth and start using like a closed loop system for manufacturing and reusing and recycling uh, materials on the moon. So do you all think uh, that the moon could be like a benchmark or a testing bed for the implementation of circular economy? Because I clearly feel that this closed loop system, like a circular economy, would be suitable to such a closed loop system. And if it is a testing bed, could that then be redirected to Earth? Because then it would be beneficial for us as well. So the short answer is yes. But you, someone has said earlier today, why don't we just do these things on Earth because they're good? And why don't we just get on with it here on Earth? I, I think it's partly because on Earth, there are always alternatives. And some of those alternatives are inexpensive and cheap. And so we're not pressured to make the hard choices, at least not yet. 
And maybe sometimes we don't realize that we should be making those hard choices, but we, we just kind of take the easy way out. There's no easy way out on the moon. And we have a variety of different reasons why we want to go there, or into space in general. And those other reasons force us to then innovate and to challenge ourselves and to overcome these very extremely difficult odds. This is a very hostile environment. There's no atmosphere to protect us from cosmic rays. If there's a solar storm, it could kill everybody. So how do we overcome those very extremely harsh environments and yet beautiful environments to succeed and, be, and, and, to over, and to thrive? And so, yes, we have to create a circular economy for our life support systems. We have to look at innovative ways to do mining. As we mentioned earlier, use no water uh, easily or no lubricants easily on the moon. So how do you make drills that don't require those things? Well, when we invent those technologies, we can bring them back home. So for example, can we do drilling that doesn't use effluents and pollute our rivers and streams back here on Earth? Can we take the uh, Blue Alchemist technology I showed on the slide earlier and build solar cells on Earth without using carbon, without, with just using clean energy, um, and in fact, use those similar technologies for mining and doing other things. Absolutely. The space programs have for years, for decades, spun off many unintended consequences in a good way. I would just add to this that, you know, uh, even before Moon, like whatever International Space Station has been doing, it is largely based on this recycle, reuse kind of concepts. And many of those applications which we find beneficial in space, we also try and, you know, apply them to life on Earth. And that is how spin-offs come through. So all this regenerative ECLSS thing. There was one particular example, astronauts carry a survival kit in which uh, they have a desalination kit. So, you know, it is expected that when they land in sea for, let's say, three days, four days, they have this kit with them so they can fill up sea water and desalinate and use. Now, some of those technologies have really good implications on Earth as well. So, I think uh, the lessons even before Moon, on the space station as well, many of these things apply back on Earth as well. Thank you. I think you had a question there. Yeah. Uh, so, Tom Carroll, Space Logistics, Northrop Grumman, we're in the same fairing, we're going to build a space station. Is there any been any standards for uh, emergency purposes of docking one space station to the other to survive a space station? Or the in every movie, escape pods, and then you have to decide who goes first, politicians, reporters, or of course engineers and astronauts and all that. The, Reporters will probably stay with the politicians to interview them, right? Since we have one, but um, escape pods or something like that of standards to be able to interdock between the space stations. Has anything been standardized and look at that? So I guess that's a question for me. Um, um, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. So I think um, there are certain standards that have evolved under the International Space Station. And I believe that most of the folks who are considering uh, a future operation of a space station are looking at adapting those existing standards for docking. But it's not true that everybody has exactly the same docking system. Uh, the Russian system and the Chinese system and the uh, US, European, Japanese systems are somewhat different. So their, their vehicles can't dock to each other uh, at this time. Um, Apollo Soyuz, of course, there was a special docking mechanism to, for that one particular mission. So I think that, you know, as we see more operators in space, that may become an interesting topic. But at the moment, uh, I don't believe, other than uh, everyone's leveraging what we've learned from ISS, I don't believe that there's a, a common standard. I will say, though, um, for maybe those who are in the room that don't know, when you go to a space station, your vehicle stays with you. So that, your vehicle that you came up on doesn't drop you off and go back home. It stays there until you go home. And so to that end, there's always a lifeboat on the station. Every crew member that's on station has a seat on a vehicle that can return back to Earth. Any other questions from the audience? Um, I was just curious that since there is a lot of impact of radiation and health impact and now you want to scale it up and, you know, put in thousands and millions of people in space, how are you mitigating that considering, you know, there's going to be a human cost, health cost, 
uh, potentially. Uh, is there some cushion? Is there collaboration um, to minimize that impact or that harm to human beings uh, who are in space? Okay, so um, yes, there is uh, you know, uh, space radiation is a hazard for any uh, space flight, but it is more so for long duration space flights. Like what is expected is, uh, let's say for a day, you would have something like 0.4 millisieverts kind of uh, radiation exposure, exposure. So there are limits defined for the entire duration of space flight as to what you are allowed to get exposed to. And uh, there are very good, uh, f first of all, there, is, there are very good tools available to estimate as to what is the kind of level that you're going to face during uh, the course of space flight. And then there are uh, materials uh, that are used to form a protective shield uh, for space radiation. And herein, you take care of not just the primary radiation, but also the secondary radiation, like uh, which you would see uh, when you have so the primary radiations will be high in terms of solar cycle when you have the peak, the solar cycle peak. But at that point of time, the intergalactic radiations will be on the lower side. So, uh, and then when the solar cycle comes down, you will have the intergalactic radiations going up. So those are the kind of secondary radiations. So you, those uh, get bounced off from the material of the crew module. So you take care of those normally hydrogen rich materials are good shieldings uh, for space radiation. So first of all, you have uh, the, uh, the testing done, you have the analysis done, there are good softwares available, ESA, NASA, they have good softwares available. Then you have uh, dosimeters placed uh, in, in the locations of the spacecraft where you expect high radiations to be there. And mind you, any spacefaring agency has been flying uh, electronics packages for years. So, uh, they are aware about this hazard and they are designed for those. So the radiation, pack, the radiation hardening is one of the things done for the packages as well. So it's not that this is something new that we are encountering. Normally in the uh, low Earth orbit, the radiation is not very high. So we are well aware about that. So you have testing, you have analysis, then you have measurement. So even in the unmanned missions, we will be measuring on exactly the same locations where the crew is likely to be there. So on the basis of that, you will have a true analysis. Then you will have the shielding also done. That's for space radiation. Likewise, you will have similar analysis, testing done, and protection for the space debris mitigation as well. Okay. So I think... Uh, also for the medical, the physiological impact on the body. I think the other aspect of the, apart from radiation, is the physiology. Like the medical aspect of the body, what it impacts in the space on the body. Like as uh, I already mentioned, like uh, in his presentation, that there is a length, body elongates. Uh, your spine uh, elongates. And uh, I was going to add a little bit on this one because I have gone through that pain myself because uh, in 2007-8, I was one of the candidate for Creative Space Agency astronaut program. So when we went through the whole selection process, I think after third or fourth round, they kicked me out. They said, being, you being too tall, you will have a more risk of, uh, of your physiological dependence and your body bra might not be capable to take that. So I was kicked out. So I was going to mention that. That reminds me my my sorrowness at that time. You wanted to say something? Oh, sorry. Well, I just wanted to add one thing. Uh, see, going into the future, we are talking of humankind in space. And looking forward from the uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Biden uh, summit, it gives me great optimism. See, whenever the world's oldest democracy and the world's largest democracy come together, they create music, whether it is in space or on Earth. Uh, let me give an example. Uh, the first rockets which we flew in India, Nike Apache, came from the US. Uh, subsequently, Let's jump and come forward to Chandrayaan-1. Chandrayaan-1 was done at a time when uh, India was still under technology denial and sanctions. Uh, the Western world still looked at India as a pariah. But the country opened its hearts out when uh, even NASA was not willing to accommodate instruments from 
Paul Spudis and uh, Kale Peters. India gave them a free ride. 2008, Indians gave the NASA instruments a free ride to the moon, which is why when India was the captain and uh, Americans and the European Space Agency in Bulgaria were players, and let me emphasize that, India was the captain, others were players. What happened? We found the presence of water on the moon. Fast forward, Indo-US civilian nuclear deal opened the gates up. 2023, Indo-US space deal. Now it opens the frontier for the universe. And simultaneously, we also have the NISAR mission which is going on. An amazing mission between NASA and India, a joint mission for saving lives on Earth. So the stage is really set for opportunity. And India is as much needed for any endeavor in international space exploration as America is. If they can give Maven mission for 700 million, we can give it for sub-100 sub million. We have our strength and we will carry that forward. So go forward with tremendous opportunity and, and uh, optimism. Don't think that we are left behind. We are, we are, we are there and we will be equal partners. Abhi jhanda to gaadi diya hai. Wo to nahi bhol sakte. Pipe lagao ke South Pole se Equator mein paani le jane ke liye. Bhaiya permission to leni padegi. Paani to humare area ke paas hai. All NASA has done is on equatorial landings. They haven't gone to the southern, southern part of the moon. That is where the water is and water is life. That is what life is all about. Okay, I think we are running out of time. Uh, maybe we can have one last question and then we'll close the session. Yeah. So I have a very specific question regarding international collaboration. So uh, Gurvinder sir uh, talked about uh, Roscos, like in the slides you showed, uh, there was a, in the, in the gateway manufacturing, there was a particular module which was being manufactured by Roscosmos. So the question is, after the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict, is there really collaboration going on between NASA and the other Western agencies and Roscosmos? In fact, fortunately, they're still going on. If you look at it, even last year there was a mod uh, Soyuz module being used by the astronauts right now. And there are astronauts and uh, training going on. And uh, I'm not sure if you are aware of it or no, but most of the astronauts or the Russian called cosmonauts, they have to go mandatory go training in Star City near Moscow. So each and every person who goes in the space goes through that training center. So that training is still going on. So collaboration is going on still. Right. So, thank you. Uh, let me first thank the audience because when the session started, Mr. Palabalog saying that there are no people here, but I think now the hall is uh, something like 70 percent full, so there are quite a few people. So, thank you for that. You've been very supportive. And thanks to all the panelists as well for your deep thoughts, for your uh, original views on the subject. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for that discussion. We started our first day talking about the Gagan Yatra to the cosmos and I think during the last three days we've touched upon the various aspects that are crucial for us to take off on that journey to the cosmos. And we are closing in on the thoughts of collaborations that are needed and how we need to collaborate on our strengths, on our strengths. and I think not just whole of nation but probably we'll need a whole of earth approach to go beyond earth. On that note, I would uh, request Mr. Anil Prakash, Director General, CI India, to deliver the vote of thanks and give his closing remarks. Thank you very much. I think it is, is a very proud honor for us to host it to you all for three days, and these three days were very, very exciting, full of excitement. And we call it, and people were initially a little spectacular about what your agenda you put forth, number of how many sessions you have, how many speakers you have, number of tracks you have. But ultimately, we have provided each one of you 
is a kind of your interest which you really wanted to attend and all four hall four halls were fully occupied or partially occupied and we have catered to your interest we are looking forward to next year a date will be announced shortly our india space congress 2024 we will be taking your we have you have given us uh, some uh, inputs suggestions we have noted down please feel free for if those who are not given please feel free to send us email i am very thankful to all our speakers all chairperson especially uh, the dignitaries uh, who have come for each day governor of haryana governor of uttarakhand governor of mizoram and this is uh, they have made our day every day started with such a exciting note i am very proud to say announce a a uh, a uh, government decision to exempt gst on private uh, private uh, launch so this is a very good statement i think this is a ci india who has given a recommendation to the finance minister before the budget and this is the one of our recommendation uh, that gst should be taken away from private sector launch and this is indeed had been accepted by by the government of india and we really thoughts and now now the private sector will definitely be looking forward a much more ambitious much more profound much for equities to uh, to be working co as a co traveler uh, with 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 the government and isro i am really thankful to the chair uh, this session and all the chairs who are previously staying i know it is tough job for you to maintain the time and i each one have scattered to time and we whole things has got and going in a very synchronized manner i am really thankful to my president dr subara pavluri who has given us he encourages us in every time and everything and given is it is a thoughts and we are also thankful to our organizing committee member two of them are in the present dr hoigde who is a, a chair of the uh, uh, program committee and um, Uh, Jeremy Rose uh, from uh, from UK. He is also part of the uh, program committee. We are thankful to uh, Dr. Shailesh Naik, who is the chairman of our organizing committee, and he has given a lot of good suggestion. And we have uh, Air Marshal Bedi here, who is a part of organizing committee, and some of members. Uh, uh, yeah, I can't see them here, but they have really put their heart and soul. Oh, doc. Oh, Mr. Govind Rajan, he's here. He's also a program committee member. So I'm really thankful to all of you. And uh, this is a beginning of new era. And we feel that India Space India Space Congress is a summit. It's not a conference. And we have achieved a certain milestone. And that milestone will carry forward. And then whatever the thing will create a reference. whatever been discussed and suggested that will go in the deliberation in conference report that will be referred as this has been discussed india space congress 2023 that has been discussed india space congress 2023 so we wanted to make this is a reference point so people who talk about where is liberalization where is processes they will refer back to the india space congress 2023 so we will like to come to your expectations some what we may be lacking may there will be some kind of error or some kind of a thing i'm really apologize for the on behalf of my team and my president uh, that we are sorry for that if you have some sort of a inconvenience in coming in part of registration or reaching out to the various conferences hall this has not been designated properly and you have to really push uh, looking into door opening door to one after the which one the one is you are looking for i will sorry for that we'll we'll make sure that in future this will not be happen so i'm really thankful to uh, our sponsors our partners they have really stand behind us and that Uh, we have been able to achieve such a gala gathering and the arrangements were made we are thankful to the hotel who has their staff they are very uh, sportive in all respect and they have created such a wonderful stay for people for three days i am really thankful to my team i would like to request them to please all of them please come forward and we like to have photograph with them my uh, colleague uh, rajiv gambhir sudipta behra anmalagan arun our anubhav prakash uh, then we have our uh, 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 anshu 
and we have Priya, Priyanka. Priyanka is just has to leave. He has to leave. Then Kushi and uh, Varenuka. Uh, we have a very small team. You will you will you will surprise you how the small team have is able to do under. But that kind of a enthusiasm you have put on through us. That's we will able to uh, prove this and we able to work for. Uh, this is this is our team. Please come forward. Rajiv, please come on stage. I request my president and board directors, please come forward on dais. I will ask. Huh. So, Sorry, yeah, please. I, I think just, 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 just. We'll just have a group picture of the last panelists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Hi, please. I have a photograph. No, no, a photograph. So we'll just have a picture of all of you. I can't be sitting in the Please have a group photograph. And while that is happening, we just have a small announcement. We found a Specs Maker's Spectacles. If someone has lost it, please collect it from us. Thank you, gentlemen. That, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the super intensive, informative, insightful, and interactive three days of the India Space Congress 2023. On behalf of CI India, I'd like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you for joining us. And as the CI India team comes for a group picture on the stage, can we please have a loud round of applause for all of them for organizing and putting up India Space Congress 2023. And for all of you, too, for the participation. We've had our coffees and lunch. I'm sure we can have a louder round of applause. Thank you. I hope you're all going away with good takeaways and had a fruitful participation at India Space Congress 2023. Thank you again for joining us. Have a good evening.